It's saying it's on Facebook. Awesome. All right, everybody. Welcome to another round of Jake Sussman Live. I'm here with a very special guest, Alicia Schwartz. And before I get into her awesome introduction, um, if you're tuning into this anywhere in the world, um, please just share where you're from. That's the coolest thing about community. I mean, people are watching this from all over the world. And it's when we realize that all of us, no matter where we are, can connect on this, on this common challenge and struggle, but also amazing gift uh, called dyslexia um, and neurodiversity. Um, so I'm excited to see that come in. Um, and without further ado, uh, this is Ellie Sheva Schwartz. Um, Ellie Sheva is a dyslexia researcher, intelligence redefiner, and podcast host. She's on a mission to decode the dyslexic mind and empower the dyslexic community to fully understand both the strengths and the difficulties of the processing style. Both her academic background in cognitive science and education, as well as her own personal experience with dyslexia, allows Ellie Shevard to draw on a unique blend of both the personal and scientific. Ellie Sheva often writes about dyslexia, cognition, learning, creativity, and intelligence, and maintains an occasional column at the Creativity Post. And lastly, Elisheva often speaks at universities and conferences with some of her latest speaking engagements, including the International Dyslexia Association's panel and University of Philadelphia. Woo! That is a bio. I was like, <laughs> sounds like I wrote that. That sounds like you. Sounds like me. Um, so welcome. Welcome, really. Um, so let's just kind of start. I mean, that was an incredible bio. You run the Dyslexia Quest, which is, you know, was one of the podcasts, is one of the most influential and popular um, on dyslexia. And let's just tell us a little bit about your story. How did you get into this space? Why are you so passionate about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, definitely. So I got into this space um, like nearing almost eight years now. And um, I started because I started um, with a blog where I was interviewing individuals that were involved in strength-based dyslexia research. And it was really like, there's a term in academia that says that all research is me search um, or good research is me search because that's the energy behind um, the questions often are animated by our own life stories. So it was really right. kind of my own personal project and I was very much driven by trying to understand um, who I was in the world and what my strengths and weaknesses were. And like, what was that experience that I just went through of like the traditional educational system? Like I felt like I got to the other side and I really needed to make sense of everything and what went on. And I was really captivated by questions around what dyslexia is around individual differences, but also broader questions around what does it mean to be intelligent? What are the different kinds of intelligence? What are what does it mean to create schools? What are schools out to try to accomplish? What are like well, alternative modes of education? And I just want, there were so many topics that I was interested in. And I just started blogging about it. And as I was blogging about it, um, I realized that most of the people that were engaging in my content were mostly parents. And, um, at the same time, it was also dovetailing with my own parenting journey. Now I have um, an almost second grader and a preschooler and my almost second grader is dyslexic as well. Um, and so as questions around parenting were becoming more pertinent in my life and noticing that almost all of my community members were actually parents, um, I began to have a deeper conversation with my community around the issues that they were up against. And um, so slowly the blog turned into a podcast and the podcast turned into a course. And then from my course that I've done and have had hundreds of people go through, and it's an eight week online course called How to Build Your Child's Self-Esteem, even if the school might be tearing it down. And it really felt like it condensed both what I've learned about how to thrive with dyslexia with all like the contemporary research and positive psychology in resilience building in, um, you know, really turning barriers into frontiers um, and created this interactive process that I was going through with parents 
by like I had two semesters so it was biannually so I had a spring course and a fall course and it was an eight-week course and it was a very powerful experience and then working with parents one-on-one and working with schools one-on-one um now I'm actually going through a little bit of a transitionary period and a lot of the dyslexia Ooh, transition is a theme right now <laughs> transition is a theme the whole world's in transition Ooh. I'm in major transition right now the dyslexia quest is in transition and the course that for the entire time that I ran it the past several years has been an interactive online course where I was leading it. Now it's going to be an evergreen course. Um, I'll let you guys know when it's all up on the website because it's not completely completed, but when it will be, you can just go ahead and purchase the course and go at your own pace. So then it will always be available to you and it can fit completely into your own schedule and your own lifestyle. So, um, so yeah, that's mostly what I do. That's what I have done. Um, and the work has kind of taken me on a journey and I've definitely have come very far from the work that I started when I began. When I began, I was hopping in my car and driving for hours to talk to people that were doing research, um, all over. Um, and I am like afraid to drive. And I remember I was just like, I'm hopping in the car and I'm driving from New York to Boston. And it, I've never had that kind of like motivation and drive before. And yeah. um, event, and I was dealing with those questions around like, is this just when people talk about strengths in the dyslexic processing style, is this something that we tell people because it's like wishful thinking? Is there causality? How much of it is actually evidence-based? That, that, that really kind of like consumed my fascination. And as time has gone on, the questions have evolved and shifted and changed. Right. And now I would say that a big chunk of the work that I do is actually working with um, parents of dyslexic children and mostly adult dyslexics. And I do a lot of work around mm. early childhood trauma and actually shifting the trauma out of their nervous system and, um, and clearing, clearing up their kind of emotional space. So they're not bringing that trauma into the present and replaying those limiting beliefs and replaying that kind of like fight or flight reaction right. into everything that they're right. doing. But that's what's really lighting me up these days. And we can talk about anything in between. Whew. Wow. Okay. So more of the story is that you're a rock star. Oh um, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Besides, I mean, that's pretty much to sum it all up, you're a yeah. rock star. And I mean, there's a, there's a few points that I wanted to touch upon, but first off, let's just talk about this podcast for a second. So, I mean, besides the fact that I also have been a guest on your podcast, which was so much fun. Um, who do you think was one of the coolest people you brought on? What, what's, what's the cool story that you have? Oh my gosh, because it's gone on for so, it, it went on for so long and it's actually in sabbatical now. And I don't know when, when I'll pull it out of sabbatical, but it's taking a long hibernating sleep <laughs> at the moment. Um, Hibernation's okay. Hibernation is okay. Hibernation is the case. Okay. Um, and when I started it, there was no other dyslexia podcast. There was like, I was the first person to do something like that. And so that was exciting, uh, kind of new frontier to tackle. Um, I've had so many interesting guests and I think that the guests have reflected my curiosities at different times and really where like personally where the energy um, and momentum was for me. So I've had so many guests that were dyslexia specific, either talking about dyslexia research or wor work in the dyslexia world. But I also have so many guests that are talking about issues that are relevant to somebody that is raising a child that is dyslexic or they're curious themselves about individual differences in learning. So like I said before, I'd have yeah. on people that have um, done research or written about intelligence, ability, um, um, different things having to do with, you know, our, is talent, nature and nurture and what the science says about that, about epigenetics. We were talking a little bit before the show went on. You said, what do you know about dyslexia and boys? And I said, I actually had somebody come on the show and he was talking about, um, he wasn't talking about dyslexia and boys, but he had an entire book talking about, you know, the kind of um, secret reasons why boys are often struggling in the traditional school system. So we tend not to think about it, 
But statistically, on average, boys are actually not doing as well as girls in the traditional school system. And there's several other places, there's there's several other domains where boys are actually falling behind girls. And of course, when you add a learning difference, that just amplifies it. But that information mm. and the research that he's done, um, he did outside of the domain of learning differences, but it's very applicable to the domain of learning differences where you see people that they have all their frustrations with learning and that's really interacting with all this other stuff. Maybe, right. you know, on average boys being more boisterous or having more energy or whatever the, the, the other topics are. Right, right. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, for, for those of you watching that don't know, I also uh, I run a mentorship program for kids with learning and attention challenges around the world. And part of what I've, I've seen is boys in particular have had a more challenging time embracing the fact that they, they don't need to be like their friends. They don't have to do exactly what their friends are doing. And girls also, it, 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 it's really both ways, but I've just seen more particular, more pronounced with boys that they, they don't want to be different because that means that they're going to get made fun of. And I think it's something that's super important to talk about and not overlook. And I really, I really appreciate you, you, you talking about that. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say before we put the recorder on and then I was like, you know what, I'll hold it for the video <laughs> is that on average, and this isn't true for all boys or all girls, just when we look at statistical averages, boys tend to externalize their frustration or anger or symptoms, which means whatever is going on internally, they, they're going to want to project that outwards where girls tend to internalize. So um, that means that whatever is going on, they're going to kind of like project their unhappiness inwards. So for boys, you're, you're seeing higher levels of aggression or acting out and for girls you see right. higher levels of depression eating disorder cutting things where the energy is going inwards so i mean if you talk to teachers that that teach in separated classroom boys and girls if a teacher is walking into a third grade boys classroom or a third grade girls classroom for a variety of different reasons those tends to be very different experiences in a you know a third grade boys classrooms they tend to be more boisterous there tends to be more energy projected outwards um, on average, and of course, there's so many people that 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 don't conform to that statistical slope, but it still exists. Um, and for that reason, often the frustration can be more palpably felt by boys right. because boys will often act that out, whereas a girl that may be more socialized to people please and is trying to put her for her best foot forward and her best smile forward um she might only break down to her mom or dad at the end of the day or might you know have other coping mechanisms where she's swallowing her frustration or pu pushing it down or you know only letting the closest people to her right. well, only letting the people closest to her to really notice that so right. it's not true for everybody but it is true for um for a statistically relevant number of people Right. Absolutely. I mean, I just can reflect on my past and I severely struggled like this because all I wanted was to fit in, was to, was to have people understand me and see me and no one did. People just did not get it. And I was so confused and that's what started to catapult this downward spiral in sixth grade of where I ended up becoming full of fear, anxiety, and stress. I had super high anxiety. I, I developed uh, I, I developed tics. I wasn't sleeping at night. And this was because, I mean, well, there were multiple reasons. Another reason was the fact that I was just labeled a behavioral problem, when in reality, there was so much more that was going underneath that schools just, they weren't willing to look at. And with all of that, compiled I hit a breaking point yeah. and that's when I was just pulled out of school without a plan my parents were just like you just can't be here anymore it's not safe and um but it just it just they, it just keeps going you yeah. know yeah, I have a whole spiel on behavioral problems and I, 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 I have a lot to say about it. And 
I often schools and teachers and people that are involved in education, if there's they're experiencing behavior that's really challenging or troublesome, um, and then they get some kind of like diagnosis or term like the behavioral issues, then all of a sudden it feels like an offense, like this and this child is acting out because they have behavioral issues. But behavioral right. issues is actually not a reason why a child, a child acts out. We need to peel the layer behind the onion and we need to ask why does this child have behavioral issues? Absolutely. And um, so often that extra layer doesn't happen. So the same thing is we say the same thing around like anxiety issues. Oh, this is a child with issues with anxiety. This is a child with behavioral issues. And then we stop there and we forget that all behavior that child is acting in, they are communicating something and it works for them in their experience and in their life. So then the question is, why is it easier for this child or why does this, this child get a payoff acting out behaviorally rather right. than doing the other stuff and there's always a reason and um, that's why I really encourage parents and teachers to look behind the label behavioral issues and really try to get deeply curious with what's going on in this child's world what are they trying to articulate and why is it that it makes more sense for them that they act out in this way um, when all children want to do the right thing and all children want adult validation and all children want that praise but sometimes in order to get that that praise it's less worth it than the alternative so getting curious about all those things i think is really important right i mean just to add to that there's a story that i love to use because it just it's so clear um it's the story of this 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 you know it's like 13 and going to karate and so excited to go to karate. He's been practicing so much to get to the next belt. All of his friends are doing it together and he loves karate. And all of a sudden, goes to karate, goes to the test, mom's waiting in the car, comes back crying, hysterical. I hate karate, why'd you make me do this? I hate you, I hate myself, I hate this. I'm never doing this again. Just hysterical. And if you look at it, one can easily be like concerned saying that the child's saying, I hate myself. But in reality, if we go one step underneath that, we just found out that not only did he not pass, but there's a fear of social isolation because now all of his friends are moving forward and he's stuck behind or she's stuck behind, it doesn't matter. But the point is, there's fear, there's this fear element of I'm now not going to be with my friends. And that's the result of the behavior. And I, I just think you're absolutely right, because I believe that everything that we hear, everything that we see with anyone is, is the surface behavior of what's happening underneath. The way that I talk to my parents is going to be different than how I talk to my friends, maybe. You know, we always change how we communicate. Maybe it's going to be different than how we talk to a teacher or a professional. And I think that's just something to remember that we all have to adjust how we communicate. But at the same time, there's this, there's this piece of expression that perhaps instead of saying all of those reactionary words and that kind of behavior, perhaps the behavior is happening because there's a lack of vocabulary to pinpoint on the emotion. Yeah. And I think that's something that, I mean, schools, I, I, I can't find me a public school that teaches emotional intelligence as a course. I've not found one yet, but that's something that I think is so important for all of our kids as they go through their next phases of academics. So. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to say one more thing about this though before Please. we wrap up. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I say that all be all behavior has reason and that we have to really deepen our curiosity around what the child's trying to say or why it makes sense for them to act that way, that doesn't in any way mean that I think that that consequences, firm boundaries, clear yeses and nos, right. or clear agreements about how a child should show up in a space, whether a home space or a school space with clear consequences, 
is not a good thing. I think that you can implement all of those, but I think how you go about thinking about the solutions that you're gonna create around this child has to be informed by really understanding the why around how they're acting. So at the same time, I think we can get curious about their why and we can address the behavior. And sometimes parents, when they hear that, when they deepen their practice of really deepening their empathy and trying to understand where the child's coming from, sometimes, that it feels like, am I not supposed to give this child a limit or am I not supposed to give a child a consequence? And I'm here to say that you can definitely do both. You can definitely at the same time clearly express to your child with what's okay and what's not okay in this space and what will happen or what the consequences will be. And at the same time, know that there's a reason that they're behaving the way that they're behaving and hold, hold both at the same time. Brilliant, brilliant. Can I add a piece into that one? Yeah. I think that's wonderful. I want to also add that I, you know, the word I'm sorry is so overly used. It could be, I mean, look, I used it when I was younger to get out of, to, to be like, to clear up space when I forgot to do the dishes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm sorry, what happened again? Meanwhile, the next day I do it again, right? So I think on top of this, you know, talking about disciplining or, you know, bringing this conversation towards the behavior, I think the discussion on recognizing the impact of the actions. Oh, I love that. So one thing that I work on with my mentees is, especially if they're late or if they're getting distracted, to be self-aware of the impact. So let's say you show up five minutes late. What is the impact of you showing up late? I'm not mad at you. I just want you to be aware that time is very valuable. And recognizing how it may come across is important. I mean, that can also come down to playing video games. Perhaps when it comes to playing video games, the impact of you playing video games, perhaps before bed will cause you to be more um, aggressive and angry. It can cause a fight right before dinner, which will disrupt the family dynamic at a dinner table. That is the impact. But at the same time, the impact of you playing could also be a positive thing. It's expression it's peace it's a time to just relax and not really think so again i think that the discussion of the impact on top of an apology is very 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 powerful now for those of you guys watching and tuning in here please don't hesitate to just ask away i'm watching the comments there is about a 15 second delay here um so just please be patient but i would love if you guys can just ask whatever questions you want and also just share where you're watching from, okay? So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that whole discussion is super, super important. Um, so, yeah, really thank you for, thank you for bringing that part up. I think that's, talk, the conversation on discipline too, it's a whole nother, whole nother ball game. <laughs> um, I think as it comes to trust, you know, if a child, when I was, when I was, when I would come to my parents about something, if it was anything, it was never met with anger or attack as in I'm you, I'm mad at you now because I came to them about something that I did, no matter how bad it was. I didn't do that much bad things, but the, the, right. That's just not, not okay. So the, the, the point no matter what it is, if some if it's, if your child comes to you about something that they did and they need help, the worst to worst worst thing to do is to get angry at that moment. Being disappointed is another card, but to be angry, what can happen is that let's say the reaction of the parent is anger or grounded or you're now in trouble. That could that whole trust between the relationship could completely get destroyed. Um, and that's just something that I'm personally very sensitive to. And I'm curious on your thoughts as, as a mom. Oh, yeah. Well, there's actually been research in the LD community. I love research. Oh, yeah. There's actually been research in the LD community that having one adult trusted confidant 
confidant has been like the difference between people that report levels of like high levels of thriving and success later on in life and people that really struggled. And that tends to be like one of the variables that makes a huge difference, which really goes to your mentorship work. And I think that, that um, a lot of the work that I do with parents is really supporting parents to help them know how to navigate this space. And this space can often be really challenging for parents because there's so much going on when a parent is holding space for a child. So, you know, very often children will will act out around the people that they love the most because the attachment feels secure. So all of a sudden you have this child that is perfectly behaved in school and then they're perfectly behaved with their tutors and then they're perfectly behaved with their sports coaches only to have like a complete meltdown at the end of the day with the parents and the parents- That was me. Yeah, Yeah. and the parents are saying like, you know, I feel so unappreciated. You know, this child holds it together for everybody else but then they dump on me and, and little do they realize that this child is uh, doesn't feel safe to disintegrate, but really they're maxed out of their capacity. They're completely maxed out. Um, they need to be. They need somebody to literally and metaphysically hold them, and um, so that they can just you know really collapse. And they didn't feel safe the whole day. So this is coming mm-hmm. out with, with people that they feel safest. You're also going to have every single power dominant situation between a parent and a child. So they're the children are going to be trying to you know do power plays, manipulation, all that kind of thing. And who knows somebody's weak spots and buttons to press more than a child. The child's going to know exactly where to press the buttons, where to manipulate. And at the same time, parents are often projecting so many hopes and dreams onto their children. They're they're often having, they're often putting on their shoulders of their children unconsciously um, hopes for them to be, um, to mirror back to the parents that they're doing a good job or that they are, they're putting hopes of success onto their children. There's all these like complicated things that show mm. the dynamic. So sometimes you have somebody that, you know, if that man or woman were to be a tutor for the next, the neighbor, ne- the, you know, the next door neighbor's child, they would show up and be like an amazing non-judgmental, supportive and encouraging presence. And then all of a sudden it's their child and all these dynamics come to play, right? The child knows exactly their parents' buttons. The parent feels triggered because the parent maybe feels guilty that they, the way that they've intervened or the speed that they've intervened, or maybe they feel guilty about the amount of resources and or, or attention that they can give the child or the the child the parent feels like they're a failure or the parent feels like um you know that they wish that their child would be more successful so that they can prove to their brother and their sister or their mom all these dynamics begin to come so much they're friends they're 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 friends um all that what i'm hearing what i often hear is that parents would be okay like they would have an easier time handling the child acting out or the child's tantrum but then when the child does that in front of the tutor or in front of the neighbor then all of a sudden the parent instead of tending to the tantrum is feeling embarrassed because they feel like they're not a good parent because the tutor is watching or the teacher is watching or there's all these dynamics that make it an extremely challenging um relationship right i mean and also on top of that because look kids are kids you know they they have their desires and their craves and their insecurities um and their lack of emotional vocabulary which is something that's our job to teach kids how to have this emotional vocabulary and i i really think and this is something that i've seen with the kids that i work with is you know as a mentor we have a very different role because we're not here to really fix a problem we're not here to really kind of coach them through stuff we're, we're here to really be with them because we we can bond over a, a similar pain, emotional pain, which is what they're currently going through. And that's what we've gone through. And we can now connect on this very deep level that teachers or their peers may not be able to understand. So what happens is when we have this level of trust, and this is something that I talk to parents on also, which is, bridging the gap between parent authority and your kids you know parents are always like oh they're playing video games all the time so i'm like when was the last time you actually joined them 
You know, when was the last time you entered their world? Something that we do very successfully is enter kids' worlds on their turf, because that's where we believe that they're going to open up, and they have been, and it's amazing. Because why would they want to open up if they're not in a safe environment? School, not a safe environment. Sitting in a chair, talking to someone, perhaps could be, but there's a lot of trust that has to be built. Imagine doing it in their world. And by doing that, you bridge this, this, this gap. And now they look at you as, as someone a little bit more than just an authority figure. And that's why for parents that are struggling to connect with their kids, especially dads, okay, connect with your kids by entering their world. It doesn't matter about entertainment. It doesn't matter how you feel. It actually matters about the connection. It matters about the connection is the priority. So we can just kind of fake it till we make it a little bit on, you know, pretending that you're entertained if you don't like playing Minecraft. But you know what? How about let's have our kids teach us how to play. Let's have our kids teach us how to, um, you know, collect their, their hobby or if they like a sport or music or whatever that is. And they may resist at first, but be resilient, be consistent with it. I, it. It really is amazing what happens when they let you in their world. Yeah. Um, and that, did, did you want to say something on that? Oh my gosh. I have so much to say about <laughs> it because I think that's, that's a really linchpin concept and idea. And I think that parents often begin this journey and they come with um, like this real, they, 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 they come kind of like facing this, the, the whole pretzel um, about like, I'm going to figure out a way to solve the problem. I'm going to figure out a way to fix it. And they put on their fixer Manhattan, they're in fix, 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 fix. And what often they forget is yes, it's important to really show up to the opportunity as parent and think, what can I do to fix the situation and to brainstorm and think about what the problem is and what the possible solutions can be. But at the same time, one of the most powerful and pivotal things that they can do is to truly witness their child and be a space where their child can fully feel seen and recognized. Thank you. And, yes. and often that takes a little bit of a light switch um, it takes takes a little bit of a pivot from parents to pivot from when my child comes to tell me something that means that I'm responsible to come up with a solution. And so every time they're saying mm -hmm. something, either I'm trying to come up with a solution or I'm shutting them down because personally, my own nervous system, I'm overwhelmed by the fact that there's another thing that I need to solve or I can't come up with a solution. So I'm subconsciously repressing right. what they're saying because I don't know how to be helpful here. Or I don't know how to fix it. To really recognizing that one of the most potent and powerful things a parent can do is to really be a witness to their child and to mir help mirror back to their child what's going on and that their child see that the parent sees them and that the parent sees them in their magnitude and in their potential and actually in the work that i do with adult dyslexics and i do a lot of work where i have a specific yeah, let's talk about this you do right yeah. let's do it yeah, so um, I've created a specific methodology that's been informed by psychosomatic training that I've been trained in, where I where I walk people through a process where we get in touch with um, childhood memories and we actually go into the body. So the work is done via Zoom and I'm walking people through meditation and they're interacting with where the trauma shows up in their body, whether it's in their gut, in their back, in their chest, wherever it shows up. And we actually, mm -hmm. through a guided meditation process, we go ahead and we shift it. And there's a bunch of things that I walk people through. And one of the things that I walk people through is people um, get in contact with those earliest memories that they've had a very specific feeling. So whether we're working on guilt, whether we're working on feeling not enough, whether we're working Working on feeling like uh, shame, whatever it is, we get to the earliest memories. And as part of the process, one of the things that they do is they think about what did the, that younger self need to hear? And it's very potent. And the amount of times that people have said, I needed to be seen is like, it, I think it would really blow parents' mind that are they're often running around and there's this chaotic 
feeling of I need to purchase the next book or I need to figure out this next solution. They feel like they need to solve it for their children. And Mm -hmm. yes, that conscientiousness, that's gorgeous. That's beautiful. That shows me how committed you are to your child. Keep doing that. But also make sure that on that essential level, that child is being recognized and that child is being seen because sometimes all the running around trying to solve it actually perpetuates the child not actually feeling the parent's presence and that the parent is there and that the parent recognizes and that the parent sees. And so often adults tell me and they say like honestly if somebody would have been able to really if I would have felt that somebody was really witnessing the extent to the challenge and they didn't even need to fix it they just needed to be like hey whatever I see how crazy this situation is I see how it's running you down I see how it's making you feel frustrated and agitated and it's not fair like how potent that little conversation would have been life-changing right and can I just pause you for a sec for you for, for our amazing community watching us, I wanna have a moment of vulnerability, okay? We are here together because we are all coming here through a common struggle, whether you're a parent or whether you're a young, a young adult or even a child watching this, with your, watching, this with your, watching this with your family. Was there a moment when you did feel misunderstood. Oh, I felt, I, I don't know if you're talking to me or if you're talking to everyone. I'm talking, I'm talking to you, I'm gonna to talk to you, I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to our community. Yeah. yeah. And if you feel, if there was a moment when you felt misunderstood and you feel like that is impacting your parenting, but at the same time, how your child is being impacted by being misunderstood. So I'll give you two options because I know this is very vulnerable and this is, we are all live watching this together. You can either comment your story or you can just like, give it a heart. And by doing that is a recognition for your own self that it's okay to talk about it, to share about it. Because most likely there are going to be people watching this and reading this that are going to have very similar experiences. So I kindly ask you, please take a minute and let, let, let's, and I, I want to ask you too, Elisha, and I'll share about mine. Um, do you feel that your childhood, whether you were misunderstood or not, impacted your parenting? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think I felt extremely misunderstood as a child, perpetually misunderstood. And I think it left me feel very disoriented because I really struggled to make sense out of my experience, which is what ultimately led me to create the Dyslexia Quest because I had this really potent sense that I had to make sense out of my experience and I had to figure it out. But I, I remember just really being baffled. Like in some environments, I remember feeling like I was the smartest person in the in the room only to be in the next environment and feel like I was the stupidest person in the room. And I was always trying to make sense of like, am I smart? Am I stupid? Am I capable? Am I not capable? Am I made for success? Am I not made for success? And um, I really couldn't, I really couldn't make sense out of it. Um, And I was significantly struggling in the traditional school system year in and year out. And it didn't seem like that was a trauma that was culturally recognized. Like people would talk about the traumas of like your parents getting divorced and people, everybody knew that that was like a hard thing. And people would talk about trauma around loss or grief in so many other ways. And it just seemed like culturally, like I wasn't coming across any TV shows or reading any books where there were characters that were, that were dealing with, significant amounts of grief and sadness and frustration and disappointment from the school system. So I couldn't really, it seemed both very significant and completely insignificant at the same time. And I didn't really have, have language for it. So that, that was a huge part of my story. And, um, and I think that learning the process of learning to not gaslight my own experience, which means that like, if I, am feeling something or like if I'm feeling tired or if I'm feeling hungry or if I'm feeling overworked to not tell myself like oh no you're not just work harder to really meet myself um, with um, understanding and care and empathy internally has been has been uh, an intentional 
relearning and has been a long road to teach myself. And I think a big part of that is not having adults call out articulately what was happening with me in school um, and how it's impacted my parenting. I think it's both like, I think that like deep listening and deep empathy is really like a gift that I give my children. But I've also really had to work on not getting over identified with their experience um, because that that's also out of balance. Right. right. You know, I, I have a, a unique perspective because I'm not a parent yet. And uh, I think it's it's really it's good to talk about this. And I, I appreciate you sharing that because as the kid, right? Because there's there's two sides. I also was misunderstood and how that impacts the way I live and how my interactions with my parents. And I think looking at this from two angles to have a conversation, you know, my mom and I, we have been very open and my, and my dad, but just open about the path and being vulnerable and having a, this kind of conversation um, you just have this different kind of connection. You know what I'm saying? And it doesn't have to be in person. Look, I mean, I feel very connected to your story. And when we create this, this, um, this like pool of trust, it's, it's amazing what kind of conversations that can happen. Um, now there's a lot of parents watching this and there's a lot of, questions and uh, concerns about, do I homeschool my kids? Do I put them back in school, COVID-19, the fall, inconsistency, transitions? Um, what do you think? Thank you. What, what, what should we, what are some thoughts for our parents can take away here um, as we start to prepare for this bizarre fall? <laughs> Yeah, I think that there are so many variables in figuring out what's right for you and your family in terms of where you live, in terms of your family's own makeup, in terms of who's immunocompromised, in terms of your own um, family priorities. And like, there's so many million different factors. But I would say that parents need to keep in mind that everybody that's in your child's grade level ha is going through a global pandemic at the same time. And so there's gonna be like disruptions throughout. So keep it in perspective that this is not an ideal situation. And what children really need is they need to, they need to have that kind of like connection with their parents where they feel seen and they feel heard by their parents. Um, they need to be up to something that feels challenging, but that doesn't blow them out, which is parents need to be thinking of what psychologist, what psychologist Lev Vygotsky called a ZPD, which means zone of proximal difficulty. So you want to try to make sure that your children are engaged in something that feels challenging so that there's that sense of meaning and purpose and what we call sweet sweat, but at the same time isn't blowing them out. And um, I think parents need to also know that if their ideal situation that they know intellectually would be ideal for their child isn't possible right now because of their, the, what parents need to do for their work situation and parents are working at home and children are homeschooling at home or because of health situations or whatever it is, that's okay too. And that parents can witness this kind of like dissonance. They can witness that like, oh, I know this is not best for my child. And at the same time, we need to do that and really have compassion for them, have compassion for their children and have compassion for the situation because it's a really hard situation. It's an incredibly hard situation everybody's dealing with different things. Everybody has different things on their plate. And some people have really significant things on their plate that are having real significant impact in their children's life. And there's not always something you can do about it besides for extending compassion to yourself and the people around you. And what that will actually do is it will keep your, um, it will keep you open and available for your children to come and have those conversations with you because instead of them sensing that you're a nervous wreck and that you're anxious and that you wish things were different and you're you're generating all this anxiety for your children to help them because you want them to know how much they care, but instead your children don't feel like you're open and receptive to connecting and to hearing them. Instead, they'll feel like, oh, you know, 
they're your presence that they can come talk to. They feel like your energy is welcoming and warm, and um, that will go very far in long term establishing that bond between you and your child and that connection that hopefully will will far uh, will have far more longevity than the pandemic, God willing. Wow. So where can people find you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're just you're just totally. I I, I want to work with you. I mean, I I think. You are just, you're amazing. You're actually amazing. Ah, oh, thank you. Whoever has worked with you, I'm sure has been, you know, totally blown away and, you know, you're changing lives for a living. And that's something that we all should really look up to and say, you know, you see an issue, a challenge in our education system and you are providing a resource to families to better reach their kids and to better understand themselves. That's that is what better life mission is that? I mean, like it's it's amazing. So where can people find you? And I'm going to post your website also on the comments. Yeah. So the best way to reach me is through my Instagram, um, the Dyslexia Quest. And on the link over there, parents or even older teens, young adults that want to work through some trauma, um, specifically sustained early childhood trauma, specifically around the educational school system. That's um, really where I specialize. You can reach out to me via the link on um on Instagram. And then very soon, the How to Build Your Child Self-Esteem course is going to come out, the Evergreen Edition. And then you guys can download that and go through it at your own pace. And that's basically where to find me. And then, of course, we have all the archives on the Dyslexia Quest up on any podcasting app. Make sure you guys watch our interview on the Dyslexia Quest. Yes. It was wonderful. I think it was the last one. So the last one. It's going to well, be right there on top. Right, right there on top. For, yes, so exactly. We'll get a little swap of roles here. So this is very cool. I mean, what's it like being the guest now? I mean, it's you've been totally like rocking the host game. And I have a lot of pressure. Guys, I don't know if you can see, but I'm freaking out because I'm the host now. But no, I'm just joking. You but, do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. So guys, please reach out to Ellie Chavez. She is amazing. I can't say it enough. And I'm so excited for your evergreen course to come out. It's really, really, really exciting. And um, is that something that only parents can take or can young adults, like, can I take it also? Um, I, it, 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 that, that particular offering is, it deals quite a bit with parenting specifically. So okay. I would recommend it specifically for parents. Um, but oh, there's wait. Lots not, not other, a big deal. <laughs> yeah, lots of other yeah. resources on the Instagram page about self-esteem that I'd encourage awesome. people to look at. Awesome. Okay. okay, guys. So here's what I'm thinking. Okay. So we're, we're going to be, I'm, I'm going to ask, you know, about two more questions. Um, but in the meantime, uh, please ask away. We had some people sharing some of their stories. I mean, it's pretty amazing um, that when we create a space to share, just how much our community comes together. And it's that's the power of Facebook. It's incredible. It's really incredible. And social media, I mean, Instagram, Facebook, um, people all over the world finally can realize that they're not alone. Um, so I guess my last question, and we'll wrap it up, is what's your superpower? Hmm. Um, I think so, I'm a healer. I think I, I think I create spaces for people to heal in. I like that. I like that. And now you've created something that can that you're using that every day. I like that a lot. So really, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, and is there anything else that you'd like to, to leave us with? I think you um, rung me dry for tonight. <laughs> all right, we are dry. Okay, I think that's a good thing. It's um, a great thing. It's a great thing. And guys, just again, make sure you follow the Dyslexia Quest on Instagram. Um, and you'll follow all the updates on what's going on. And I'm gonna hang out um, after this on the comment section and I'll be available. Um, and if you do have any questions about our mentorship program, please feel free to reach out to me. 
It's the Discovery of Superpowers Mentorship Program. It's phenomenal. We're really changing lives. I mean, I really feel like that we should team up at some point. It's going to be great. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions for Ellie Sheva and you want to reach out to me, I'll be happy to pass it along to her or you can just comment to her directly. Um, and guys, thanks again for, uh, for joining us here. And thank you, Ellie Sheva. Perfect. Awesome. Have a great night. Have you a great can. night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.